Um, and I just wanted to say hi, I'm Pastor Grace. <laughs> and just to share, um, I had an amazing time in the worship. Thank you, worship team. And somewhere in the midst of the worship, I just had a flash picture. And I saw in, written in fire, Europe shall be saved. Yeah. Amen. I am, I am beyond convinced that God is doing something in this church, through this church, and in the nations. And I think that we just need to raise our expectation. God is about to break through everything that we have ever prayed for or cried for. The time is now. We are in a time of acceleration. We are going to see the glory of God. Gird your loins. Let's go for this. Let us seek God like never before. And let's believe God for revival. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to be here. I um, managed to sneak in and sit in the balcony for the first message that um, was part of the Women's Fellowship. I didn't sneak into all your other conversations. We're just the, just the preaching. <laughs> I think every woman here needs to hear those words. I think every man needs to tune into what was said here. I know that it's on Facebook. I hope you guys are diligent to go and, 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 and catch up on these things. I just want to celebrate this house. You don't know how unique and amazing this place is. I tell you that as a missionary from, from Africa, that there's a, there are prophetic purposes that uh, Europe has to, to answer to. And in, um, in the 80s, God began to invade Europe through sending, sending back the sons and daughters of missionary work that was done in those many hundreds of years ago as Europeans braved dangerous seas and crossed into remote parts of the world, brought the gospel to what was defined as a dark continent. Today, the dark continent has become a second chance uh, for what God wants to do in Europe and the Western world. As revival hotspots are sending sons and daughters back to Europe to, to bend the knee and to lift up hands in worship and in prayer, and for us to soar back to mom to our mother, spiritual mother countries, Britain being in the lead, which is where we are. And uh, definitely Sweden, the heritage of revival on this nation. Uh, but especially the, this house and how it's placed at the very center of Stockholm and the name that it carries and the miracle that you are here. The diversity of this church blows my mind. I don't know how you guys have done it. I wish I could copy and paste. <laughs> but I want to honor Pastor Wilberforce and Rhoda. Thank you, pastors here, men and women in the house. You guys need to thank God for what he has given you and be good stewards. I want to be part of this. Whether you like it or not, I'm part of this city church. <laughs> I'm part of it. I... We just love your pastors. We, we love what God is doing here. And we want to honor Pastor Paul and Teresa here. Something beautiful is going on here. And, uh, and, and you, you smell the temperature of a church in the worship. Did you feel that? Something we, we could have just worshiped all, all night here. Time stops at a certain point and you just feel the heavens open. And uh, because of schedules, we can't surf these waves as long as we should have. And so here we are, I'm, I'm going to try and behave, but I have a fairly long message. <laughs> I'll try and preach and finish within good time. Pastor Grace is leaving tonight because she has to attend uh, to her uh, uh, job in, um, uh, as a busy lawyer in, in, in London. I'm staying a couple more days, so tomorrow we are together in some shape or form. I don't know what I will do then, uh, but it's been publicized as something to do with prayer. My passion is 100% answered prayer. That's my drive. Everything I do, I say, could this be the answer? That unlocks 100% answered prayer. So today I want to speak very much in continuing the theme in a sense. Uh, we've had a wonderful family weekend. And what I've found in uh, over 27 years of ministry is unless 
something answers to principles of family, it does not work. God is a God of families. And as we celebrated couples and then women, um, at the heart of it all is, is family. God is a God of family. And what is working at City Church here is what answers to family. We are a family. We are God's family. This church has got to be a family. Departments, structures do not really work unless they answer to family. Unless a department becomes invaded by family dynamics, it cannot really work. And um, I also want to say in my introduction, families do not exist as, as a name in themselves. You, you don't belong to a family to just be a family. Families are growth units. They are units in which God puts us that we may grow. If you are single here, I challenge you to get married because you'll grow up spiritually. I hope you do. Because if you don't, know, if you don't grow, the marriage will kill you. Marriage demands for spiritual growth. Having children demands for spiritual growth. So families are growth units. God puts us in families to grow. And this coming year, we are celebrating 30 years as a couple in marriage. But it's all about growing up. If you will not grow, the marriage will kill you or you will kill each other. It's about growth, 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 growth. Now allow me today to just be very poignant and very straight with you. And uh, most Christians be stop growing after 10 years in Christ. Some even five. Most believers get into stagnation and stop growing. And we need to unlock growth, otherwise we die in our cities. We kill our churches. Christians who do not grow kill their church. They exasperate their pastors. They fight each other in departments and in worship teams. And wherever you send them, they will not prosper because they are not growing. Jesus said, you did not choose me, I chose you, that you may go and bear fruit. So the purpose of the call of God is for us to become fruitful and to grow, not to just shout and clap. Christian growth is at the heart of the call of God. And as I'm saying, most of us stop growing after a few years. And today we, we want to challenge ourselves to go to the next level because the nations are waiting for us. The cities are waiting for us. So today I'm going to speak on Christian growth under the subject of discipleship. And I'm going to use a video. So I'm, uh, my, my man right here, is it a lady or a man now? It's a lady. There was a guy there a moment ago. What's your name, my dear? What's her name? Lillian. Lillian's going to help me preach. Yeah? Now let me give you this. Initially, you grow through sermons on Sunday morning. When you're a new believer, you can grow off sermons preached on Sunday morning. But that will only take you so far. After a certain point, you begin to chew up sermons and spit them in the bin. You don't even remember what was preached. You become acclimatized to the preaching environment. Growth then moves to small groups. So you hear sermons on Sunday and discuss them in small groups, in small dynamic exchange groups, cell groups, departmental groups, partnerships, prayer partnerships. You need to move from Sunday gathering to small group expression. Now ask your neighbor, do you belong to a small group? We, we've got to talk. We talk about taking Europe. We will not take Europe unless we understand the dynamics of families. Yeah? So initially you grow off sermons, then you must grow in small groups, intense exchange in small groups where you begin to discover your gifts and begin to deploy them. Then again, growth slows down in a small group. And this is when a small group becomes a small clique and it becomes a gossip fellowship. <laughs> All is overtaken by food and tea. You guys do tea. And the purpose dies and all you are is just a bunch of friends who are all stagnant and not going nowhere. So growth changes from small groups to mentors or disciples. You must find somebody who mentors you and speaks into your life to take you to the next level of growth. 
So we have three stages of growth spiritually. Number one is what we call early growth. Number two is intermediate growth. Number three is advanced growth. I'm running quickly here. Now ask your neighbor, which stage of growth are you at? Early growth, intermediate, or advanced? <laughs> God forbid that Pastor Lincoln is still learning the alphabet of spiritual life. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I need to move on from alphabet. I need to go to words and sentences and then paragraphs and then essays. Huh? I need to write dissertations. There's scope for us to grow spiritually. I don't want to overintroduce, but I warned you I may preach long today. Lift up your hand and say, I must grow in Jesus' name. I must grow. By the way, did your neighbor tell you what stage of growth they are at? Early growth? Intermediate or advanced? You know, in early growth, we talk about, oh, Jesus is in me. That's not enough. After he's in you, we need to go to the next level. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to understand the gift of tongues. You need to understand how to walk in the Spirit. Then you need to go to advanced growth, where you become not just a, present, a steward of God's presence, but a steward of God's glory. Yeah? So this is a, Europe is going to need glory to break. Ordinary intermediate believers are not going to manage to push the thing we are pushing. So are you ready to grow? Okay, so I want to show you today that you need two ingredients in your life to grow. One is you're being accepted and loved and embraced and invited and loved. The other is you need to be challenged and confronted. You need somebody in your life who says it's time for you to move from where you are. You need some, someone who stretches you. So on one side, we love you, we accept you. On the other, can you please change? Yeah? We need both the two ingredients. Now I'm going to show you a video. And uh, Lillian is going to help me. Are you ready? Eyes on screens. Ready, steady, go. This is a sport called the rodeo. It's in uh, America. It's uh, mainly by cowboys. It's called the rodeo. And it's all about surviving on top of a horse. The longest they normally stay on the horseback is eight seconds. After eight seconds, it becomes dangerous. Pause right there. Pause there. The rodeo is a dangerous sport. Eight seconds is all you can stay on the horseback. The pressures on your backbone are incredible. And the trophy winner usually maximum is eight seconds. But some of them drop off in the first second. Now we're going to watch it again. This time there won't be music. Allow me to talk over it. So Lillian is going to trigger it. I want you this time to watch this. And imagine you are the horse. Jesus is the rider. You are the host. Jesus is saying, I want to teach you how to pray. I want to teach you how to forgive your neighbors. And you're saying, no, 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 no. This is too uncomfortable. I can't do this. I can't do this. This is uh, an indisciplined horse cannot carry anybody. It cannot carry purpose. Jesus is trying to ride us and do, to do things in and through us, but you are so uncomfortable about, oh, no, no, I can't forgive my enemies. Oh, I don't like giving in church. I find worship weird. Prayer meetings are confusing. Believers are impossible. But pause right there, pause right there. Now, I want you to see the miracle. Uh, so in this house, all of us will fall in a different category. But God wants to ride you. As we will see in scripture. God wants to teach us something now. Horses are some of the most elegant animals to find. I don't know, I've not spotted horses here, but people fly across in their tourist endeavors to, to see the elegance of a horse.
But that's where it starts from. Horses don't want to be ridden. They want to be free and instinctive and wild. But when they submit to a process of training, look at where it ends up. Let's trigger this. Look at the elegance of this. Play now, Lydia. You see the difference. After training, after discipleship. Hey, now these are racehorses. Millions of krona. Millions of dollars exchange hands just because horses were trained. This is a dancing horse. I mean, look at that. This is Olympic. Dancing horse. You think, can a horse dance? Yes, it can. Can a believer dance in church? It is possible. <laughs> it is a discipleship issue. Please pause right there. Please pause right there. Ask your neighbor, can you dance in church? <laughs> Even that is a discipleship issue. You ask some, dance before the Lord, and somebody goes. <laughs> and it looks like a simple thing. Dancers drive out sickness. Dancing can break yokes. It's not a joke. David danced before the Lord. And things and structures can change just by the dance. People testify of tumors disappearing and yokes breaking off their finances because the body becomes immersed in the spirit of God. These are discipleship issues. I'm overstretching a point. But it's the process of moving a horse from being a wild beast to becoming a creature of elegance by which armies ride into the battlefield and great feats of, ex of exploits are done on the battlefield in Olympic stadiums around race courses. It's a process, my friend, to bring out the best in anything. It is a process. And when God brings us in from the wild, it is for a process. And Christian discipleship is the journey, the process by which God removes the wild instinct and makes us tame, structured, disciplined, fruitful, powerful believers. And the more you grow, the more power you can express. The more you grow, the more impact you can bring into the earth. The more you grow, the more answered prayer you enjoy. And so today we break the spirit of stagnation off, off this house. We are going to the next level. It's time for us to go to the next level. We need to move away from discussion of the elementary truths of A, B, C, D in Christ. We need to be writing spiritual essays and dissertations. We need to move away from little ditties of music to singing huge, eloquent musical pieces. Hey, orchestra stuff. I'm using language, you understand. The process of changing or moving a horse from being a wild animal to a, a, an elegant beast is called the breaking of the horse. That's the original language. And so I want you to see what the breaking of the horse traditionally used to involve. Let me show you. Uh, a guy here called Monty. And the video is pl playing. Now, breaking of the horse is a process that the horse will be put through. Traditionally, the horse is tied with ropes. This is the best video I could find. We tie it with, a ho with ropes, constrain it, beat it, until it submits. This is a a guy called uh, Monty. Monty was a, a hostile horse trainer. You see, this is, this is trying to get purpose out of a horse. Can you pause right there? Sometimes as a pastor in the years, I felt like tying believers down with ropes. <laughs> you know what I mean? You sit for hours trying to get fruit out of a marriage. My wife will tell you sometimes I've gone home needing counseling myself <laughs> after contending with a fruitless believer who destroys the grace of God, consumes the word of God, and nothing comes out. And you think, Lord, shall we tie them with ropes? <laughs> shall we detain them in church, lock them up in prayer meetings? <laughs> but that's not the way. So horses would die in the process of trying to make them fruitful. Play, my friend. Just play. 
Paul says die. Some of you feel like someone is fighting for you just to try to get your marriage to work. Why should somebody stay up all night trying to make me be fruitful for myself? Why should life have to fight me? Why? Now, this is Marvin Roberts. Pause right on. Marvin Roberts was a cruel man, but he was the best hot horse trainer in the U.S. He was a cruel man. He would attack these horses. And some of them wouldn't survive. But he was celebrated for breaking horses. Now, his son, if you play on, his son, Monty Roberts, watched him. He watched this man become more and more cruel. I hope you're playing Lillian. Yeah. Uh, Monty, his son, watched the savagery involved. That's Monty, his son. Monty watched and said, there's got to be a better way of training horses. So that's Monty Roberts much later in life. He became a celebrity because he found a way of training horses. Please pause right there on Monty. Monty became so famous, he traveled the world, he made millions. He even has a brand of horse products called Monty Roberts. But it's because he watched his father and said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way than torture. And so he left home and went to the fields to find out, could there be another way? Could we find a language to communicate to horses and find better results? Please play on. Now, Monty left home and went into the, the bushes, went into the wild plains where horses are. Pause it right there. Look at that. Horses wander free. Eh? So much potential, but untamed untrained and they wander the plains and live a purposeless life and die unknown in total contrast you find a horse and millions of pounds are changing hands they are horses that are connected to the royal family of Britain they are brushed regularly they are dewarmed and they are they are Manicured, you find horses that cost more than your house <laughs> because they have gone through the discipline process and they have upgraded their value. Monty found after months, weeks in the, in the plains that horses have a language, that there's a culture, that they are not just beasts out in the field Wondering, they actually are disciplined in the wild, but they have their own disciplined structure. And you see, as I've battled with the church over the years, I've said, God, show us principles. And I found this principle, and I studied it, and I extended it. I did a bit of research. And I want to share with you and show you how horses change. And uh, some of the most dis powerful discipleship programs in the world now work with the same principles of horses. You look at them, they look like scattered, confused groups of animals. But there's a language that Monty found out and began to use to train horses. Play it on, Lillian. Let's see what follows. So, you see, there is structure in the world of horses. Do you see that pack? There are groups. And there are. He found that there's leadership amongst horses. Leadership. Do you see the structure? There's lines. That one is a confrontation going on, a discussion between two horses. This is a mother disciplining a child. There is something going on. All creation was made to function on principle. That's a mother rebuking a little child. I want to show you these principles. Now, please pause right there. Monty found at the head of every herd, there is one leader, the lead male. There may be other males in the group, but there's always one leader. Does that sound like something you know? Even amongst the bees, there are leaders. Even amongst termites, there are leaders. One of the most difficult species on the earth is called Homo sapiens, the human being. Even termites recognize leadership. 
And when you, have you ever found African termites? Uh, these uh, they are what are called safari ants. They march like soldiers in line with purpose and focus and destiny. I used to stand as a child and watch them march across my mother's compound like an army. And there are these soldiers who just stand in place and open their fangs. If you touch us, we attack you. These are our brothers, these are our sisters. You don't touch them. We are on mission. We are migrating. They stand guard. They keep ranks. Oh, look at your neighbor. Just look at them. Say nothing. Look at them. Their ranks, their tasks. Do you know in time? When you find a mound, this is termite hound, there is one queen. There are soldier ants. Soldier ants do not vote overnight to overthrow the queen. They just serve in their ranks. They even run farms. There are farms in ant hills. They collect fungus, grow it, and then collect it and put it in storage. They feed the mother, the, the queen, the queen ant. They collect eggs and they store them in line. Creation from Am I still there? Creation has a structure. Jesus, help us find structure. Without structure, churches go nowhere. Without structure, families go nowhere. And many times we are rebuking the devil. The devil is saying, it is not my fault. It is the mess that your home is. And so God has got to help us because we need relationships with structure for us to grow. For us to bear fruit. So Monty found, now I want you to see the picture. I told you there's one lead, lead uh, horse, it's normally a male. The male's defi defined task is to defend the herd, to lead it, and to make sure it remains safe and to procreate. This is his mission. The female one is to teach and train and to rebuke and to correct the herd. Now, the, the picture you see is the picture of the lead male, female. This is the lead female. When it is in correction mode, it collapses its ears back like that. This is, this is a rebuke session going on right here. <laughs> she is tasked with ensuring the herd has discipline and structure and order. And when there is a, a rebellious in submissive horse, she collapses her, he, her ears and takes that horse to the side of the herd. No words are exchanged, just looks. It just, do you see the look? Silent correction. And this is what, he, what Monty observed, is when a stray horse comes to join a herd, the lead mare will spot it and meet it at the edge and this stare will happen. It will just look at that horse. It is saying, you're coming to us, but we are a family. We have structure. We have leadership. We are organized. You don't just join. You are joining a family. You are joining a structure. That is the look. Move it on. Let's see the next one. So this is the face of a lead May I told you we need two elements, and this is what he found out uh, in the wild, that even horses need and practice these two elements. You're going to see the next one. Uh, uh, continue playing. That's it right there. That look of saying, you want to join us? We need to talk. <laughs> now, this is what he found out. After that, pause it right there, when the lead female confronts this new horse or any stubborn horse and stares at it, what follows is the other horse drops his head. It's a sign of saying, I am willing to learn. It submits. Tell your neighbor, submission is essential for Christian growth. Yeah. The horse drops his head. Monty was just observing. It drops its head and it claws on the ground like that. You can see that implied. Uh, let it play a little more. 
Let me play forward now. The other thing that he found the horse does is it licks its mouth with its tongue. That, that picture is coming uh, in a moment. So that is a sign again of I'm ready to learn. By the way, all this is juvenile behavior. The horse may be one year old, but it will behave like a child. Pause it right there. Jesus said, except you change and become as children, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there's this humility, this need for, for Pastor Lincoln, even though he's Pastor Lincoln and has been a pastor for 30 years, I need to know how to humble myself and listen to somebody correcting me. Now ask your neighbor for me, do you have anyone allowed to correct you? Do you have? Do you have anyone who challenges you to go to the next level? We need, I need somebody in my life who comes and calls me to order and say, Pastor Lincoln, that was out of line. I need to give at least one person permission in my life to challenge how I'm living. Hello. Usually, it, the first one is your spouse. Any married people? Come on, married people, don't be shy on me. Usually, your spouse will tell you... <laughs> Uh -huh. Something has to change here. My wife must have a freedom and a sense of comfort to speak to me about areas of my life that she's concerned about without her head being beaten off. And vice versa. Your pastor needs to be able to do that. But then some other people need to come alongside. Do you have somebody who challenges you? Or are you surrounded by people who just do the fanfare? You are the most amazing. When the reality is you are rotting on the inside and somebody needs to help you. I need somebody to correct me. Please roll the video forward. Time is running. I want you to see where it ends. Now, pause it right there. This is what happens. When the lead mayor confronts that horse and it bows its head, this is what follows, what Monty realized. That horse, the lead mare, turns around and shows its back to this new horse and begins to walk. And the other walk, the other horse follows her. It is an invitation. We want you to come. Be with us. Please come. Join us. Join us. Come. Be part of this family. She walks a few steps and stops and turns around and the confrontation returns. And over a period of about 10 to 20 minutes, this dance continues. Come, change. Come, take note. Come, change. It's a rhythm. A rhythm of celebration and discipline. A rhythm of acceptance and challenge. Thank you for what you're doing, but you can go to another level. Thank you for all that you are, but I noticed this rhythm of challenge and invitation. Challenge and invitation. Uh, each time this lead mayor goes closer and closer until this happens, until they join heads. If you play it, it's called a join up. That point where head touches head between the lead mayor and the newcomer. Please pause. Now ask your neighbor, are you still with us? Join up. Touch. Our lives need to touch. God has been challenging us at Liberty. Platform preaching is not enough. I need to touch you, my brother. I need to sense your being. I need to feel your manhood. We need to touch one another in intimate relationships. There's got to be somebody who gets close enough they can smell your, your, your smell. I'm not talking physically. I'm talking about picking your spiritual scent. 
You need to open your life to somebody. You need to come close enough. For goodness sake, I better be that close with my wife. We need to be able to touch and for her to feel me and for me to feel her. Not this kind of relationship where we say I do at the, at the front and then we go and live separate life for the rest of our lives. No, she must feel me and I must feel her. Hello, guys. Married couples, are you with me? Our children need to come close enough. There's got to be people who are close enough to smell me and say, Lincoln, what is that? What's going on with your life? Join up. Once their heads touch, that horse is admitted to the herd. Monty was watching all this. Now, this is what he did. He went and began to practice without his father knowing how to translate the language of horses into the horse breaking process. And what would take his father six weeks of torture to do, he did in 30 minutes. 30 minutes through using the language of horses. And I'm going to show you Monty now in action. I want you to see the, the Christian discipline uh, involved in this. So now I want us to turn to the word of God briefly. How am I doing with time? I'm still okay. Okay. Let us go to the word of God briefly. And uh, then you'll understand where we are going. Luke chapter 19 and verse 29. Are you still my friends? <laughs> okay. Luke 19 verse 29. It came to pass. When he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where as you enter you'll find a colt tied. A colt tied on which no one has ever sat Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus shall you say to them, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he has said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, what are you, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt. And they sat Jesus on him. And he went, and, 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 and as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Amen. The taming of the colt, the story, this story is a miracle. Because uh, uh, when we go back to the, to the video, you saw the picture of a colt. A colt is a young horse. It can also be a young donkey. Anything in that family is called a colt. I'll go back. Uh, uh, uh -huh. stop right there. Now that's a young horse. That's called a colt. There was one younger even before. Up to four years old. We don't know how old this colt was. But what we know, no one had ridden on it. That means it is wild. It is tied outside the, the city because it has no profit. If you put cargo on it, it will go... He will go crazy. So it is of no use. It is untrained. And that's how you are as a believer until God has really taught you his ways and you submit to the yoke of his word because things that God puts on you, you will just react and throw them off. So Jesus says, go find a cult. No one has written on it because Jesus wants to show a principle. And they said, if anyone should ask you, loose it, bring it to me. If anyone should ask you, tell them the Lord has need of it. The Lord looses us that he may ride us. Deliverance is not an end in itself. You are not delivered to be free. You are delivered to be used. You are delivered to be yoked. You are unyoked to be reyoked. The yoke of bondage goes away and the yoke of service begins. Can somebody say amen if you hear him? Yeah. Loose him. Loose Jacob, bring him to me. Loose Susan, bring her to me. Loose Jane, bring her to me. Should any demon protest, tell them the Lord has need of Susan. That's why she must be free. The Lord has need of Jane. 
That's why the bondage must end. Lusa, bring her to me. And should anyone challenge, tell them the Lord needs her. And so this untamed horse comes, and the miracle is Jesus sits on it, and it's instantly tamed. That miracle, we don't add to his miracles. But it's an amazing thing that a cult that has never been ridden carries Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. But I want her to just anchor that in the scriptures. Now I want you to see what follows. Let's, let's roll forward. So Monty begins to work with horses. And as I said, he finds that in a period of 30 minutes, I want us to observe this pause right there. Now, Monty went to his father and told him, Dad, I have found a way to train horses in 30 minutes. The father attacked him and beat him with chains. He needed hospital treatment to recover because he was a wild man. And he said, how dare you think you know more than your father? But Monty walked away from home and started an alternative practice of training horses. And what would take his father six weeks, he did in 30 minutes. Now I want to show you Corona. Now Corona is a wild, untamed horse. All methods have failed. Corona is a willful, stubborn, fruitless colt, but not colt, but horse. And I want you to see Monty in action, and I'll close with this. I want you to see the process that God typically takes a believer through to get fruit out of you. Now, here's Corona. She hates being ridden. She will not be touched on the back. She would, doesn't want... So, pause it right there. What, uh, what um, Monty does, straight away, from the beginning, I want you to first see that there's a ring around this. Do you see the fence? This is the process of fruitfulness. God began to show me the first thing he does if he wants to make you fruitful is he puts a ring around you. He puts a ring, a, he creates a pen. There's a, a pen. God makes you a glorious prisoner. You need to belong somewhere where there are boundaries. Touch your neighbor, sell them boundaries. Yeah. You need a wife. Uh oh, okay. I'm just preaching to the singles. Or a husband. You need a son or a daughter. You need a job where the boss is made in hell. You need a department in church where you must show up in time and submit to a leader you are more gifted than. Yeah? You need to find a pastor and submit to them. Find a church and belong to that church. Tithe and be caught in that discipline. The first point of Christian growth is you must commit yourself somewhere. As long as you remain a free spirit, you will never grow. Now tell your neighbor, the pastor is preaching to you. You need a pen, you need a purpose, you need a commitment. And some of us become allergic to commitment. So you enter a department and you resign the following day. You start a job and you're out of that job. That pastor, that boss is demonized. I'm out of that. This church is not anointed enough and you run. Now this wife is not beautiful enough. I'm marrying another one. You run around the place because you hate pens and enclosures. Give me a wave if you are with me. First point is enclosures. God puts you in an enclosure. A glorious enclosure. And you become a glorious prisoner. This is the bondage of freedom. So now this horse is used to running the plane, but now it is in a pen. I want you to watch it. So what Monty does, he says, okay, this is what you like. Do it. You like running? Ah, okay. And so you begin to trot. One church to another, one department to another. God even makes sure there's someone very difficult there so that you may run. And you run. That one, 
all my friends on Facebook are boring. Delete all of them. <laughs> Boundary. But you know, in Christ, once Jesus has put a finger on you, however much you run, huh? you will never run the same. This is now running in a pain. Click my sister. Let them, let's, and you see, he even goes in front of us, now try another side. Sometimes God allows you to roam the city. And he watches you as you go church to church, department to department, relationship to relationship. Oh, I deleted Tom, now I'm with Harry. And God is watching you. <laughs> this is what Montevan, he said, now pause. He, they found horses keep running until they have exhausted three quarters of a kilometer. They run purely on instinct. Instinct, this is what I love. Horses run. So they run. Instinct. You see, as long as you are living by instinct, you can't really grow far. Your instinct is to be angry. That's how you rehearsed all your life. Somebody, hey, I'm so angry. I'm so angry. <laughs> Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has given me anger. <laughs> some, some people feel anointed anger. <laughs> it's your instinct. Your instinct is to delete people, fight with people, leave churches. <laughs> uh, one of the sisters in our church, she, came, she brought me another reference form. I said, didn't I just sign three references forms this year? She said, Pastor, all the jobs are demonized. <laughs> I said, no, you are the one who is demonized, not the job. <laughs> we need to talk, friends. So, Instinct. God says, your instinct. Okay, go for instinct. Go for If you want to live instinct, go for instinct. There's a brother who told me, Pastor, I don't even know why. Pastor, everywhere I go, girls want me. They want me. I don't know what to do, Pastor. Me also, I just give them the blessing, you know? <laughs> the blessing that I am. <laughs> I share with them. <laughs> God is watching, and he says, I'm going to catch you one day. Now watch this. Okay, let's trigger this. So at a certain point, after three quarters of a kilometer, I want you to watch what happens. Let's watch Corona. Tired. Exhausted. Getting tired. Monty is saying, go on. Go on. You want more? You want more women? You want more jobs? You want to go to another church? Okay, you go. 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 You will see it dropping its head at some point. Keep going. Keep going. Don't stop it. Keep going. Monty, I mean, Corona is getting tired of... Do you ever get tired of being the same person? Look at that. Drop head. Pause right there. Drop head. I'm tired. I'm tired of breaking hearts. I'm tired of marriages, marriage one, marriage two, marriage three, marriage four, proposal one, proposal two, proposal three, I'm tired. How many are tired? Jesus said, come to me if you are tired. Huh? And you are tired. <laughs> tired of being fruitless, tired of being prayerless, tired of being purposeless. A point comes when you must drop your head as a believer and say, I am fed up of being a statistic. So, Corona drops her head. Remember, this is an untamable horse, but he's using the principle of the, of the plane. Okay, do you see it slowing down? Drop head. Now, it begins to come closer to him. Jesus said, come to me. If you're tired, come to me. Come, come. Follow me. It's okay. Follow me. And then he touches it. Are you ready for some purpose? Can we go to the next level? Yeah? Are you tired of messing your own life up? Come, follow me then. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fish as a man. Come, come on. Come. Come, come, come. Uh, 
Uh, but Lord, are you sure? Am I safe? Yes, I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. Before I made you in the womb, I knew you. Come, I have a plan for you. There are plans. And you see, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Hmm? For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. More, this corona has accepted something on his back for the first time. I have things to teach you. There are places I want to take you. There are friends I want you to make. There are ministries I want you to join. You need to join prayer meetings. You need to join discipleship groups. But these things, are, they are going to inconvenience you. Your time may be consumed. But there is a reason why I want to use you. Yeah, I will show you the way. Ah! Oh, no, 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 no. I should have never accepted this. I should have never joined this group. I should have never married this woman. <laughs> oh, no, 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 this was a bad idea. So he removes the rope and says, okay, then go. And now you're back. But this time you have a yoke. This time you have a yoke. And there are people, pause right there. There are people in this place, God had you some years ago. But you broke free. But you will never be the same. Because his yoke is on you, his finger is on you, the purpose of God is on you, the election of God is on you. Where you were before is not where you are now. Yeah? God is saying, okay, have another run. Go and terrorize Stockholm for another two years and you run around. And God is saying, okay, when you're tired, can we talk again? Let's play this. Go back a little, just a tiny little bit. Were you able to go back a little, Lillian? I don't know how they came to meet. Okay, this is it. This was the last gallivanting. You see the rope, the rope is still there. Still there. But God is trying to say, okay, maybe he's just having a temper tantrum. And it's okay, he's not about to do this. Okay, 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 let's lose him. Lose him. You are released. Boom. Hey, hey, free from Jesus. Free from ministry. <laughs> huh? And then you are tired again. He says, are you ready now? Can we do some work? Can we do some work? Corona. I have a plan for you. Come, learn to pray. Learn to give. Learn to submit. Learn to be a good wife. Learn to be a good husband. Those children you had are not baggage. They are not toys. Spend time with them. Pray with your children. Prophesy over them. Slow down. Know when to come home and when to hug your children. I want to show you how to do family. I want to show you how to do marriage. Are you ready? Uh-huh. This time Corona is saying, okay, I'm ready, Lord, to consider this. And now he's saying, I'll lead you. God's Bible says, do not be as stubborn as a mule or a horse. That must be bridled. See, initially, you start with long ropes. God gives you a bit of freedom. Huh? That's how, how the, a rider comes in. We, have, we want to take it to the next level. Before the saddle was empty. Now he goes. The first rider. You see how tentative that is. Even the rider is saying, ha, this believer. You quite never know. Tentative ministries international. Let me see if this person can carry this. So we go slowly and easy. Easy does it. Easy. And we need an entire team to supervise you as a believer. We have a counselor. We have a prayer warrior. Everybody is attending to you. <laughs> Finally, Corona is on her own. For the first time, she is carrying somebody. And the days of freedom and fruitfulness begin. One step at a time. 
That's the end of the film. And I must wrap up. Hmm? So, <laughs> I'll look at your neighbor one more time. Say nothing, just look at them. And put your ears behind if you can. Just put your ears behind. And just look at them. <laughs> Friends, I, I, I could have preached 10 different messages. Let me summarize this. Tell your neighbor for me, God has a plan for your life. Yeah. There's cargo you must carry for him. There are trips you must make for him. There are sacrifices you must make. No one will carry your yoke for you. You must carry it. But you first of all have got to accept the boundaries and enclosures God is putting you in. Responsibilities. Stop running from departments and ministries. And stop hiding from prayer meetings. Stop running away from leaders. If God has called you, say yes to the call of God because you waste your time running up and down. God has need of you. And that's why you were set free from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. That's why you were flown. Some of you swam across the waters to get to Sweden. Some of you came by air, some by sea. Four purposes over the city of Stockholm. We need to say yes to the call of God. We need to understand training is necessary. You need somebody to impart something. You need to learn the disciplines of prayer. You need to understand Christian discipleship. You need to read your Bible. You need to understand the Christian call is a discipline. And somebody is willing to help you. Stop running away from relationships and from commitments because the Lord has need of you. And so, many times, our families are in trouble because God is in trouble. God is fighting me, therefore my family is in trouble. And many times, marriage counseling is a waste of time because it should rather be discipleship counseling. If I can become a more fruitful disciple, my marriage will thrive. If I can become a more fruitful disciple, my children will be fine. So today, we present ourselves before God. And we resign from the spirit of Corona, the willful horse. And we want to say yes to the yoke. Yes to the calling. Yes to the burden. Now, some of you have been running. Everybody's standing because time has gone. If you know you've been running, I want you to run to the front. Yeah. If you know you've been running, taking cover. Oh, Lord, I'm not ready. Oh, Lord, you know. I come here. Time is going. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes. Come on. Come on. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I'm gentle and humble in spirit. And you'll find rest for your souls. Some of you have been running from Jesus, you've never been born again. And you keep running. Today you are under arrest in Jesus' name. I came with an arrest warrant all the way from London to arrest you and take you to Jesus. Because the time for running is over. Anyone here, if you want to recommit your life to Jesus. Some of you have been running around Stockholm with a saddle on your back. <laughs> God had started a good work in your life. Then something went crazy. And you ran out of church with the saddle. God is saying it's time to come home. It's time to commit and take this thing to the next level. Thank you, Jesus. So many people here. Lift up your hands to him. Surrender. Say, here I am, Lord. I'm tired. I'm ready. Say to him, here I am, Lord. No more running, no more excuses, no more fighting. I say yes to your calling. I say yes to the yoke of discipleship. I say yes to transformation and to change. I am ready to be used. I'm ready to be free. I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to go to the next level. Today, 
I hand in my resignation to the powers of darkness. Enough is enough. No more of my time. I commit myself to the purpose of God over my life, to the call of God over my life. I surrender to prayer. I surrender to ministry. I surrender to Christian growth. I surrender to the relationships you've ordained for me. Thank you, Jesus. Talk to him, talk to him, talk to him a little more. I know everybody here, wherever you are, can still go farther and deeper in some way. Father, we thank you today. What are you saying? I give myself away. And you do, I give myself away so you can use me. Do you know that song? Everybody lifting up your hands across this building. This family weekend, we are saying yes to the call of God. Thank you, Father. I want us to, want us to sing this song together. <laughs>